Hi, I'm Daniel Aaron Dilger with Roughly Drafted Magazine on video. This is the 10 Myths of iPad number 8. And this one is looking at whether the differences in the iPad over the iPhone and iPod Touch will serve as a curse on Apple's current mobile developers. Yukari Kane, a writer for the Wall Street Journal who last year wrote about the iPhone as being a huge problem for Japan. How it would never do well in Japan. And he outlined all sorts of reasonable sounding reasons from the fact that it was kind of expensive to the fact that it didn't have features of other Japanese phones to the fact that he didn't think that Japanese people would be able to figure out the app store and download applications. Well, he's back again with a new take, this time the iPad, and it's just as negative. After briefly noting that uh, developers in general see the iPad as being a tremendous opportunity, he took a lot of time to dwell on the fact that, that there were changes and there were, there were some applications for the iPhone that may not work on the iPad, including ones that make use of its camera. The iPad doesn't have a camera. Well, interestingly, Apple's other mobile device, the iPod Touch, doesn't have a camera either, and it hasn't for two years. So if there was some cataclysm of nightmares brewing for the iPad, surely that would have kicked in two years ago when the iPod Touch was delivered without a camera. In addition to missing a camera, another app uh, that he says is popular on the iPhone but won't work on the iPad is Looped, which allows you to report your current position and see where your friends are on the map and, and connect with people who are nearby. He says the iPad is simply too big for this. Well, people who buy an iPad are probably going to have an iPhone as well, or some other mobile phone that can run Looped if they really need to. So this seems to be a problem in search of a problem. To put the differences between the iPhone and iPad and iPod Touch into some sort of relevant context, look at other platforms. Microsoft's Windows Mobile is so convoluted that the company actually has two definitions of smartphone. There's pocket PC phones, and then there's Windows smartphones, which are phones without a touch screen even. So developers who want to reach the entire audience of Windows Mobile phones have to accommodate for things like UI, very basic things of how do you make an app that can work both on a device that's entirely controlled by buttons and one that responds to touch. That means they basically have to create two apps for every title they want to create just to be able to enter it into Microsoft Store. Another big problem facing Windows Mobile is that every device has a different resolution and not only a different screen resolution but also a different aspect ratio. Some are wide, some are narrow, some are square. So developers have to accommodate their apps to, to deal with all those different changes. And because every phone is different, they have to decide what, how many phone, different phones are they going to really target and support to make their apps look nice on. Google's Android has some, some of the same problems. In fact, Google is even more slack on, in terms of managing its platform. Every developer of Android phones, each one has an overlay of junk that they put on it. HTC has something they call Sense. Motorola has the Moto Blur, and Sony Ericsson is talk calling their new UI Rachel. Different Android phones also ship with different versions of the operating system that are significantly different. Some support features that aren't in uh, other versions of, of the operating system on earlier phones. Some even new phones, like Sony's er Sony Ericsson's phone, is shipping with a much older version of, of Android than today's or even last fall's uh, new Android phones. So this is something that developers have to manage, and this is a pretty significant problem. On Apple's platform, Apple tends to keep everyone on the same version of, of the iPhone OS, and when a new version is released, even a minor update, it gets propagated pretty rapidly because everyone can install it themselves from iTunes. With Android or Windows Mobile, it has to line up the carrier and the manufacturer because each one is introducing changes. And because of that, different phones are gonna be on different operating systems throughout their life. Some early phones, like the G1, won't even be able to up, be upgraded to the latest version of Android. Of course, Windows Mobile and Android are both far behind uh, where Apple is with the App Store. So they need to do more than just catch up. They need to solve a lot of pretty ser serious and significant problems with the actual phone hardware that's creating all this fractionalization in the platform. To indicate that his criticisms aren't really something that can be taken seriously or should be taken seriously, Kane also brought up the old rag about Flash, parroting Adobe's marketing speak that not having Flash is going to be a serious problem even though it hasn't been for the last three years. 
Kane also harped on the problem of not having background processes, something that prevents the iPhone from being infected with spyware and adware and other malicious software that users don't know that's even running in the background. Everyone worried about that being a problem for the iPhone before it came out, but nobody's worried about that for Android. Far more interesting than the fear, uncertainty, and doubt being spouted by tech pundits who are worried about the curses that might affect uh, mobile development because of the changes in the iPad is the flip side. The positive interest that developers are showing in media companies, particularly Disney, looking at the iPad and, and seeing an opportunity to do new things, not just same apps that they've done for the iPhone and, and spreading them out a little bit, but actually creating new things like interactive TV shows and comic books. So the gold rush that we saw for the iPhone is just getting started with the iPad. Really, the only curse in tablet computing is going to be coming out of the mouths of Apple's competitors who spent the last decade bringing out tepid hardware designs and brain-dead software platforms that nobody found interesting. So that's myth eight of the 10 myths of iPad. Check out my website at RefleyDrafted.com and my Facebook page, Roughly Drafted. Add your uh, comments to the discussion there and let me know what you think.